saved by grace. What a wonderful thought that is. How often do we hear expressions like that, or at least very similar to that? Hello, my name is Cliff Goodwin, and I'm so thankful that you have tuned in to be with me here today for preaching the gospel. And I hope now that you'll take your Bible down, whether at home or at the office perhaps, and let's open the Word of God together as we explore this wonderful theme, Saved by Grace. Now, for many of you in our viewing audience, when you hear that terminology, your minds will probably go to Ephesians chapter 2. Remember Ephesians 2 and verse 8, where the Apostle Paul penned, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. And for me also, if I hear the term saved by grace or I hear discussion along these lines, I too will likely go in my mind to Ephesians chapter 2. And yet today for this study, we're going to go to another Pauline epistle, not the book of Ephesians. And yet, it is an epistle that could very appropriately be subtitled, if you will, God's Grace and Good Works. And that's the epistle known as the book of Titus. And so I'm opening my Bible presently to Titus, and we'll begin here in just a moment in Titus chapter 2. So maybe you can open your Bible at home with me as well. Titus chapter 2. And we'll begin in a moment at verse 11. God's grace and good works. If you were to sit down, say, after this broadcast is over, and if you were to read the entirety of the book of Titus there in your home or your office, wherever you might be, it wouldn't take you very long at all to read these three chapters. But as you read them, if you were especially aware of these concepts, you would be impressed of how many times in the book of Titus you read about good works. Paul is instructing Titus so that Titus, in turn, would instruct the Christians on the island of Crete, and in that instruction, good works come up time after time, even in the course of this epistle. And again, this epistle is only three chapters long. You You could likely read it probably in less than 15 minutes, if it would even take you that long. But also in the same letter, a letter that is saying so much about good works, it is equally unmistakable the emphasis that Paul has therein on grace, the grace of God. Now, it is terribly unfortunate that In our modern religious world, so many people create what is really a false dichotomy. And by that I mean in their minds and often in their profession and in their doctrine or their teaching, it's as if salvation is either by grace or it's by man's own good works, but it's either or. And that's a false dichotomy. And they take it to such an extreme that they say, well, if salvation is indeed by grace, this is where the the fallacy especially comes through. If salvation is by grace, well, then good works have no involvement whatsoever. Well, you have to be very careful. There's an understanding there that we need to strike or else we're going to find ourselves at odds with the Word of God. And what I mean is this, our good works, they do not contribute at all to the basis or the source of our salvation. Our salvation as sinners before God, its source, its basis is solely on the free grace of God, the, the willingness on God's part to save us. And were it not for that basis, were it not for that foundation, well, then we would have no hope. But that is not to say that this, God's grace, is unconditional. 
And, and many people, that's, that's how far they take it. And that's the extreme to which they run in order to get away from, in their minds, they're trying to get away from meritorious works and, and man's earning his salvation, which, by the way, is absolutely false. Man does not earn his salvation. But in trying to run away from that, they eventually wind up at the other extreme wherein they allege that God's grace is unconditional. You know, we're saved by grace. We're saved by grace only. God's grace is extended to all men. Therefore, we are all unconditionally saved. And that, too, is false. That is contrary to what we find in the Bible. And so in this regard, the book of Titus is a wonderful aid. It is a wonderful uh, source of study so that we can see the balance, how that our salvation, the basis of our salvation is truly and solely by the grace of God himself. And yet his grace comes with terms. It comes with conditions. And as man complies with the grace of God, it will be evident there will be seen good works in his life. Those good works are not earning his salvation. He is not meriting salvation by what he does, but the two meld beautifully together. And if you see anything in the book of Titus, you'll, you should be able to see that upon a careful reading. And so today from this book, what I want us to do is I want us to notice three points about being saved by grace. Point number one, let's talk about the statement of grace, the statement of grace. Now, I told you we would start in Titus 2 and verse 11. This is an interesting thing here, 11 and 12, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation. Paul is unequivocal in that. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. We would understand that it is available to all men. God is no respecter of persons, Acts 10, 34, and 35. Therefore, regardless of race and ethnicity, regardless of social standing or clout, regardless of material wealth or poverty, None of these things matter. The grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared. It is available to all men. Now, that's wonderful. That's gospel. That's good news. But now, put the next verse with it. Verse 12. This grace, the subject of verse 11, verse 12, is teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now, my, is that not different from what so many extremists in the religious world today have to say about God's grace? Oh, God's grace is unconditional. Oh, God's grace is a free gift. Oh, God's grace doesn't make any demands on you or on your life. Oh, that's false. That's false. According to Titus 2, 11 and 12, what the Holy Spirit now, mind you, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul, what he said was, the grace of God teaches us, teaches us that we should deny ungodliness. We should deny worldly lust. Those are negative aspects. Positively, we should live soberly. We should live righteously. We should live godly in this present world. And so when we speak of being saved by grace, I think it's very helpful for us to perhaps begin by acknowledging the statement of grace. And namely, the statement of grace could be described or summarized as the Word of God. What would you know about God's grace to save your soul eternally were it not for the Bible? You wouldn't know anything about the grace of God were it not for the Scriptures. 
And so the, the Word of God is the statement, if you will, the statement of God's grace. And as we delve into the Word of God and as we read and ponder and meditate upon its contents, it becomes rapidly evident to us, clearly seen in our hearts and minds, that God's grace teaches us. It teaches an ethic. It teaches morality. It teaches a plan of salvation whereby man is, is to be saved by the grace of God. The grace of God teaches us. Stay in the book of Titus and back up with me into chapter 1. Notice how the very epistle opened. Titus 1 and verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging, other versions will read simply, the knowledge of the truth, which is after godliness. Now think about that. Paul says, I am an apostle. I am one sent by Jesus Christ in so many words so that I can minister to the faith of God's elect. My labors are directly tied or directly uh, interested in the faith of God's elect, the knowledge of the truth. As an apostle, my work is to see to it that men and women are aided in knowing the truth. Now, why would any of that matter? If salvation is simply by grace alone and, and grace is unconditional, grace is just freely given, grace has no demands on your life whatsoever, then, then why all of this talk about truth and godliness and faith? Why all of that talk in verse 1? Verse 2, he continues, his work as an apostle is in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Now that hope God had promised, but hath in due times manifested his Word. God had made known unto man his word. How? Through preaching. Now, that involved the work of Paul and others. He has manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. And so again, when we're talking about the grace of God, I want to be crystal clear in, in telling you that you cannot divorce, you cannot separate the grace of God from the Word of God. The grace of God teaches us, according to Titus 2 and verse 12, and if it's teaching us, where do we find that instruction? And the answer is in none other place, period, than the Bible, the Scriptures. And so we might summarize the Word of God simply as the statement of God's grace. I think about what Paul told the elders of the Church of Christ in ancient Ephesus. He had called them out to Miletus for a meeting and while he was meeting with them prior to, to their parting ways, he said in Acts 20 and verse 32, he said, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an, in, an inheritance among all them that are sanctified by faith that is in him or in his son, Jesus Christ. Think about that, the word of his grace. And so grace is not simply some mystical fog, you know, that many people in the denominational world, they, they speak of the grace of God really in near mystical terms, as if it were a fog or a vapor that that lands on men and women, and it saves their souls. And no, the grace of God is God's favor extended toward man and revealed to man 
in the Scriptures. It, it was demonstrated in the offering of His Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross, and that's going to be our next point. But there's nothing mystical, per se, about that. It's something that God has revealed. It's something that God has manifested through preaching of His Word, and we can know it, and we can understand it, and and more importantly, we can comply with it. We can submit to its terms, and my, how important that is. So the statement of grace, number one. But now, number two, let's talk about the sacrifice of grace. And as I just mentioned, this is where the redemptive work of Jesus Christ comes into view. And and we know that Paul said on one occasion in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 2, he says, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so it was evident that the crux or even the focal point of the Apostle Paul's preaching and ministry was Jesus Christ and him crucified. Do you know why that happened? Why did Jesus go to the cross? Why? Why why did he die? Because of the grace of God. That was God's favor toward man demonstrated in the redemptive work of Calvary. Go back to Titus chapter 2 with me. Verse 11, the grace has appeared to all men. Verse 12, God's grace teaches us. It, It makes demands on our lives, telling us to depart from ungodliness and worldly lust, telling us to employ sobriety and righteousness and godliness in our lives. But the next verse, verse 13, looking, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now notice verse 14, this Jesus Christ, this great God who came in a man's body, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. See, Paul Paul didn't get the memo. (laughs) He didn't get the memo that grace and good works, they, they are mutually exclusive. Well, that's false. Again, that's false. The, the redemption that we have and enjoy in Jesus Christ and whereby he has purified us unto himself, we now are to be his own special people. And what is to characterize us as such? We are to be zealous, on fire for good works, that is, obviously, in his service. And and so the redemption that is effected by nothing else but the blood of Jesus. I'm sure many of you in our viewing audience, you're familiar with the words of the old hymn, What can wash away my sins or yours? And the refrain, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, as I summarize or paraphrase verse 18, no amount of money, no amount of silver or gold could have effected our redemption. Now, that was characteristic of the typical redemption of a slave in the first century world. It took money. But Peter says no silver and gold, verse 18, verse 19, 1 Peter 1, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, that was the purchase price. That was the payment price whereby we could be redeemed from the guilt and condemnation of our sins. And it was the blood of Jesus. And so there would be no statement of grace. Think about it this way. There would be no statement of grace were it not for the sacrifice of grace. Is that not true? In other words, 
Had Jesus Christ not gone to the cross, had Jesus Christ not shed his blood, had Jesus Christ not given his life there at Calvary, what message would there be to proclaim? What what word would there be to preach? What standard of life would there be to which man must conform? Remember, Jesus left us a perfect example. But if he's not our Savior, if he didn't die and pay the price for our sins, then what's the point? What's the use? And so there would be no statement revealing and proclaiming grace had there not been the sacrifice of grace. Number two. And now as we continue onward, number three, let's talk about specifically the salvation of grace. The salvation of grace. Now, for this, we come over into Titus chapter three. We've been in Titus two. We've been in Titus one. Now let's come into the final chapter. Uh, Notice with me at verse three what Paul said. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers, lusts, and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Is that not a bleak description in Titus 3 and verse 3? I mean, that describes unregenerate man. That describes sinful man prior to his obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right there, Titus 3 and verse 3. But notice the first word of verse 4, but. (laughs) But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Earlier we read how that the grace of God hath appeared to all men. Here we read that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared not by works of righteousness, which we have done, again, the grounds of our salvation, the basis of our salvation has never been our own good works, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now notice verse 7, this drives the point home, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We are justified by and in keeping with the grace of the favor of God. None of us deserved it. None of us. What we deserved was death. Romans 1 and verse 32. Romans 5 and verse 12. Romans 6 and verse 23. What we deserved as guilty sinners was death and eternal separation from the God who formed us. That's what we deserve. But, verse 4, the kindness of The love of God, our Savior, thank God, toward man, it appeared. It appeared in the coming and in the ministry and in the ultimate death of Jesus Christ on the cross. The kindness and the love of God came, and it was by his mercy that he saved us. And so I want you to notice some thoughts here as we talk about the salvation of grace. To drive this home, number one, notice that the source and the basis of our justification or salvation is grace. That's verse 7. We're justified by his grace. Notice number two, that that means that this was not something devised of ourselves. When verse 5 said, not by works of righteousness which we have done, it's not saying that works of righteousness are unimportant or works of righteousness are not good. It's not saying that. It's saying that we have not devised and we have not executed our own means of salvation. We, We cannot work enough good things in order to bring God in our debt. 
so that God finally has to look down on me, for example, Cliff Goodwin, and say, Cliff, you, you've just done so many good things that, that I'm going to have to save you. Friends, that's a farce. It, it just doesn't work that way. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but it's according to his mercy, his own mercy by which we are saved. You know, I have heard a gospel preacher before point out that when it comes to the grace of God, you have basically three component parts in the grace of God. And I, for the longest, I had never learned that. I had never realized that. But those three component parts are found right here in this context of Titus 3. When you're talking about the grace of God, his favor toward man, you study closely and you'll find kindness, you'll find love, and you'll find mercy. And right here in this context, verse 4, you'll notice the kindness and the love of God. And then verse 5, you'll notice the mercy of God. You go back to Ephesians chapter 2, that great chapter on salvation by grace, and right there in that context, you'll notice the great love of God, Ephesians 2. You'll notice the mercy of God, also in Ephesians 2. You'll notice the kindness of God in Ephesians 2. All of these are component parts of God's grace. But finally, before our time expires and we leave this text, I want you to notice how God's grace saves us. Let me say that again. How or in what process or by what means does God's grace save us? Because Paul deals with that in verse 5 here. After he said, but according to his mercy he saved us, he employed the Greek of preposition dia which means by means of. How did he save us according to his mercy? By or by means of the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now, dia is only mentioned once. It's not repeated. So that tells us that this is one act, but it's twofold. There are two aspects to this one event or this one act. And it's called the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. And if you've studied your Bible very much, you immediately recognize a parallel. You remember when Jesus spoke to Nicodemus and he said in John 3 and verse 5, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, the washing of regeneration, and of the Spirit, the renewing of the Holy Ghost, He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. See, it's through the doorway of baptism, immersion in water based on faith and penitence and confession. It's through the doorway of baptism that one enters Christ, according to Galatians 3 and verse 27, and in Christ we are saved.